Hello out there. Welcome to Wake Up to the Bible. I'm Daniel Kaplan. I'm here with my father, Dr. Kaplan, and we are going to be going through the books of the law, Genesis through Deuteronomy. We're doing it in a yearly cycle, and we're breaking up the portions in the traditional Jewish manner. So today's portion is going to be Genesis 12, 14 through 13, 4, and I'm going to be reading from the Robert Alter translation. If I could figure out where I am. Okay, there we are. And it happened when Abram came into Egypt that the Egyptians saw the woman was very beautiful. And Pharaoh's courtiers saw her and praised her to Pharaoh when the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And it went well with Abram on her count, and he had sheep and cattle and donkeys and male and female slaves and she asses and camels. And the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his household with terrible plagues because of Sarai, the wife of Abram. And Pharaoh summoned Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her to me as wife? Now, here is your wife. Take her and get out. And Pharaoh appointed men over him, and they sent him out with his wife and all he had. And Abram came up from Egypt, he and his wife and all he had, and lot together with him to the Negev. And Abram was heavily laden with cattle, with silver and gold. And he went on by stages with the Negev up to Bethel, to the place where his tent had been before, between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar he had made the first time. And Abram evoked there the name of the Lord. So this is a short little passage, but it is an interesting little aside story because it's a little it's a little peculiar on, on multiple levels. Um, exactly you know the the what we're supposed to get out of this it's the the actual passage doesn't particularly in my opinion explicitly tell us the the spiritual lesson so what 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 comes to mind when you hear this passage well as i said uh, yesterday or uh, when when well, this will be heard yet this will be heard the day before this one um that um it does foreshadow the experience of israel and egypt but besides that we have to understand lying is wrong adultery is wrong now abraham may have felt like he was being maybe wise as a serpent harmless as a dove because she was his half sister but it's, it still was deceptive and could have caused a, a lot of trouble and we see here that e the pharaoh of egypt did not want to commit adultery so you see the ten commandments are are in the bible before they're codified uh, i think that's important It is interesting to me there because I've actually heard people um, disagree with that, and I'm not sure how they get there in terms of your the ultimate Pharaoh's reaction. Because some people say that the Pharaoh's reaction makes it basically justified in a sense that Abram was deceptive because they say, well, was it really that he thought adultery was wrong or was he just upset because he was plagued? And was Abraham basically correct that had he not lied, he would have been killed? And so therefore, it is kind of more like you said, it's kind of wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. And it's like, it's one of those moral quandaries. There's a few times, and this is going to come up in the Bible, where people are deceptive to somebody trying to impose harm. And the Bible takes an interesting position on it and sometimes not really being very as, as clear about it as i think some people would want um it's interesting to me i'd like to make a comment on that I, that interpretation i think is is uh understandable i i would like to say this under the old covenant the sinaitic covenant uh, one could kill in self-defense at times the people of israel went to war if you can kill somebody in self-defense then you can lie to somebody in self-defense a war is based on deception. George Washington, who quote unquote never told a lie, used deception quite effectively against the British. So let's get the context clear. Mm. That's a good point. That's a good point. Um, another thing about this is, um, <clears throat> is I find it fascinating how even amidst the situation, God uses this as a method to give Abram more wealth. That's just bizarre, right, too. And that also points to uh, sometimes, you know, people have those those verses that float around, you know, the, the by the fruits, you will know them and things like that. And they see blessings and they assume that 
that's a sign of something really solid underneath or something. And it can be, but it's not always, right? We have to be careful. We have to be careful that God can make, take lemons and make lemonade. Just because you have the lemonade doesn't mean uh, that what was going on was so was going hunky dory. You know, um, it, it's it's a challenge for all of us. And uh, I'll 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 balance that with another comment. Some people feel like like God has something against rich people that he he's only he's more favorable to poor people. That's not the case. Uh, a lot of uh, the, the heroes of the Bible were quite, quite well to do as Abram here. Well, it's an interesting thing uh, from a literary perspective, right? Because uh, often the in, uh, in in literature, you know, they, they you have a driving force. You know, what is the person trying to achieve in life? And if you wanted to to kind of simplify Abram to a goal, I would say the big thing that's a driving force for him is offspring, right? So he has all of this this wealth and everything, but he doesn't have a child, right? And that's why ultimately what he's tested on is not, hey, you know, give up all your gold and follow me. It's your child, right? Because it seems like that is really the driving force. So just because we have those verses, of, you know, like the rich man coming to Jesus saying, give up your wealth, that doesn't mean that's going to be everybody's problem. And I think God does give people uh, in uh, for their benefit wealth that know how to handle it sometimes. And we should be grateful that they are given that opportunity and they are able to handle it well, you know, and not just assume that it's always ill-gotten gains or something, something negative for sure. One interesting, uh, this is kind of a nerdy sort of thing, but uh, one thing that people have talked about with the Pharaoh and his plagues, obviously that's going foreshadowing, right? Because we have... We have uh, uh, we have a pharaoh and plagues later on in Exodus, but uh, it is interesting to speculate on what those plagues could have been. And some people speculate that it's specifically tied into him not being able to take on Sarah as his wife, which I find kind of whatever humorous or whatever, but plausible, right? Because, you know, it's also a way for God to specifically intervene so that the, the adultery doesn't in fact take place, right? That would make sense too, that it's not explicitly said. Mm, out of respect to him, yeah. <laughs> right. All right. So that being said, did you have any other comments about this uh, passage? No. All right. If you've been enjoying this podcast, like, subscribe, hit the bell, tell your friends, uh, and feel free to read ahead, ask us questions, uh, post questions below in the comments about what we've read today or a future passage. We'll see them. We get alerted. So even if it's one way in the future, you know, if you're just thinking and you're like, I always wondered what they said in numbers five or whatever, feel free to put it in. I'll put it in a note. We'll get there one of these days, right? You know, we're going from Genesis to Deuteronomy. So feel free to comment and involve yourself and we will see you tomorrow.